Okay. Uh, Gerard, it's nice to meet you. Hello. Nice to meet you. Gerard, what, what was your role in the movie Eating Our Way to Extinction? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I guess you could call it the uh, uh, science fact checker. <laughs> um, I actually wrote the environment uh, part of the book that accompanies the documentary, the first 200 pages. Um, I've got a background in science, so uh, this was natural to me. Um, but I've been used to uh, make sure that every fact that's uh, given in the documentary um, is, is correct. Um, Kate Winslet's solicitors were very insistent that we had good science back up to everything that she said. Great. Thank you. And then, hi, Glenn. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you, Steve. On the subject, food is climate. Uh, that you were here last year, so thank you for joining us again. My pleasure. And Ocean, how are you? I'm well. Thrilled to be back with you, Stephen. Good. How did your summit that you recently concluded go? It was great. We just hosted 319,000 people in the 2023 Food Revolution Summit docuseries, which is, you know, several stadiums worth of people and you know, it's an amazing privilege to have that opportunity. And it's so inspiring how many people are part of this revolution we're all building here, you know, and, and wanting to create change with their own lives and also change in the world. You know, I, I spend a lot of time talking about food and health, but part of what lights me up is the revolution. It's like the, the global impact we can have, because I'm not just somebody who wants to be healthy. I think health is for a greater purpose. And I want to help people live lives of contribution and joy and quite frankly, contribute to a better world. So I'm so glad we get to have those conversations here. Thank you. Now, I'm a little too busy to buy other people's um, conferences and webinars, but I bought yours because I felt it was, first it was only like $97 and it had a plethora of amazing speakers that I just wanted to hear what they had to say. And I didn't have time to watch it live. So I thought I would just buy the video. So can people still buy that? Yes. Uh, if you go to foodrevolutionsummit.org or actually summit.foodrevolution.org slash empowerment, it's all available to, to get the, the whole the whole series we put together. And so um, Ocean, yeah. Ocean does something very similar to what we do. He has a summit with amazing, amazing speakers. Um, and he gets the very best of the best people in the world on this subject to come speak. So, And when we have you on, do you feel like we put you on the panel that we we feel this is so urgent? I know you also have a lot to say about food and the food system, but because food and climate feels more urgent than anything, I put you on this panel. Is that a good fit for you? I, I, I love it. You know, I, I feel like um, for me personally, the future of life on earth is such a big deal. It's sort of like dwarfs everything else in a way. And I personally believe that every one of us would like to leave our kids a better world than the one we grew in, grew into, or at least a livable world. And the fact that so many of us are living with a sense of doom or dread about what our kids, grandkids, great grandkids are going to inherit is is terrifying. You know, we would spend our lives hoping to save something, hoping to give them something, give them a house, give them a little nest egg, send them to college. Wouldn't we like to give them a livable future where they have water and food, air to breathe, and a climate that they can count on? We would, of course, and yet we're in a situation where we can't promise that to any of our descendants right now. The good news is we can do something about it. And so to me, this is the message we need to be shouting from the rooftops. So let me start off with the last question. You you know, Glenn has this book, okay? He, he says a lot of very brilliant, important things. Ocean, you have a lot of things. You had the food revolution. Eating our way to extinction was you know, might have been the most high profile movie ever made on this subject. So while we are going to talk about this, you guys have talked about this. You have shared it. What is going on? What I mean, I'm looking at this stuff and I'm thinking this is exasperating. This is crazy. This is urgent. This is horrifying. Um, there are other people, important people that are seeing these movies and books and conferences what are they saying what did the media say when they saw your stuff what did the politicians say what did the government agencies say what are the leaders of our country and world saying are they saying we don't care are they saying 
we don't have enough money to do it. Like what, what's been, assume someone sees everything you've said and reads it carefully and watches your film. What is the reaction of our leaders when they see your stuff? Well, Steve, if you're talking about our political leaders, as you know, we have two major political parties and one of them for the most part denies that climate change is man-made and is happening at all. Uh, and the other party, the Democratic Party, absolutely uh, believes it's an urgent problem. And they seem to believe also that it's a problem only of how we generate energy. So that if we could just move to clean sources of energy, the problem will be solved. And that's a fantasy. Uh, you know, we could debate what percentage of the climate crisis is dependent on energy generation. Um, and what percentage is is related to animal agriculture. But I would argue that by far, and I did argue in Food is Climate, that by far the largest contributor to greenhouse gases is animal agriculture. And you have to start by looking at land use. And it's it's it seems to be beyond the capability of our current crop of political leaders to address land use. You know, they're, they just don't talk about that. I don't know if they don't know the truth or they're just they find it politically difficult to uh, to broach that subject. Can yeah. you explain what you mean by land use? What, well, what how much let's let's compare cars with cows. And uh, I, I Googled it today and there are roughly the same amount of cars and cows in the world, about one point five billion. Um, and uh, how much of the earth do we devote to cows and how much of the earth do we devote to cars? And they each get a good deal because there are a lot of roads in the world that we have because we have to have transportation. But with, with animal agriculture, you're looking at 37% of the non-ice land surface of the earth devoted to animal agriculture and another 6% of the earth devoted to growing grain to feed the cows and other ruminants. So, uh, so much of the earth is being devoted to animal agriculture. It's by far the leading cause of deforestation. It's by far the leading cause of biodiversity loss. So, uh, and, and that's not even mentioning the oceans. You know, so the oceans are being destroyed more than anything else by industrial fishing. And the oceans are 70% of the earth. So I like to say that the solution to our climate crisis is to protect as much of the earth as we can. And how do you protect the earth? Well, there's one clear way by not eating animals. You could protect the oceans, which is 70% of the earth. And you could protect roughly 40% of the land surface of the earth. And you could rewild and reforest much of it. Can you so, go back? You're saying 37% of all lands yeah. is devoted to um, you know, raising animals. But are you saying that means all the food that we're using to feed them? Or because I don't it doesn't no, look I, like I just I just mean land used for grazing, where the cows and the sheep roam. That seems high. It doesn't seem like 37% of the whole country is covered with cows. Uh, in the United States, I believe it's closer to 50%. But how, how does that make sense? Because I, if I drive around, I don't see 50% of the land covered with cows. Um, because you're not looking <laughs> at all the ranches. You're not doing a tour of all the Depends ranch where land. you're driving. Yeah, for sure. But I think <laughs> Nobody some of that goes on ranch also, land tours. Some of that land is also used for um, growing corn and soy and other crops to feed to livestock right as well i mean the, the guardian uh published an article um from a on a major a study on this a few years ago and they found that um you know worldwide 83 percent of the world's agricultural land is used for animal agriculture for 18 percent of the world's calories and 33 percent of the world's protein and that if just theoretically the whole world went vegan tomorrow We'd save an area of land equivalent to the entire landmass of the United States, China, European Union, and Australia combined that would instantly be freed up. And that 
that could be used to reforest or rewild, that could be used for carbon sequestration intensive crops, that could be used to grow food organically for future generations of humans. We'd save so much land that, 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 could, that could be so much more productive for getting carbon out of the atmosphere. And instead, we're literally chopping down and burning rainforests so we can create more grazing land for cattle. But, but are you saying the basic the basic thing is someone wants to eat a hamburger. So to eat a hamburger, they need meat. And to get meat, they have to take cut down forests to have land to grow soy and corn and then more land for the cows to graze on. And they have all this land devoted towards soy and corn to feed these cows that are taking up all this land. And that combination of food for the cows and the cows themselves takes up so much land and to create the land, they have to cut down trees. Is this the basic formula of why eating a hamburger is causing tremendous amounts of land use? Is that the general, do I have it right in general? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. And then of course there, there are the direct emissions from animal agriculture. The cows are belching methane all day long and exhaling carbon dioxide. Now, when, when animals exhale carbon dioxide, our leading climate spokesman at uh, the UN, the IPCC, they like to say, well, that's just part of the natural carbon cycle. Cows, animals exhale carbon dioxide, trees sequester carbon dioxide. But you know, when, 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 a, when a car emits carbon dioxide, that molecule of carbon dioxide can be sequestered by a tree, just like the exhalation of a cow. Carbon dioxide can be sequestered by a tree. Gerard works with trees in Australia. Would you agree, Gerard, that the trees don't make a distinction between where the carbon dioxide comes from? Yeah, ab absolutely, Glenn. So, so, uh, so when the IPCC excuses the fact that there are 1.5 billion cows in the world by saying, well, that's just part of the natural carbon cycle. We shouldn't, we shouldn't compute how much carbon dioxide they're exhaling. Well, then why don't they say that about cars? That's just part of the natural carbon cycle. The cars are emitting carbon dioxide. The trees are, are sequestering it. So we, we can't view it that way. We have to view it according to how much methane is coming from animal agriculture, how much um, nitrous oxide is coming from the fertilizers to grow the corn, to be fed to the cows. How much, how many trees have been cut down that would have been sequestering carbon dioxide, what we call carbon opportunity cost. How much soil has been degraded that would have been richer soil if there were trees on the soil. And when you add all that up, you see that animal agriculture is most of the problem. And as far as deforestation, is that simple that they just cut it down trees because they need more land? That's just simple. And then when they cut, and what's wrong with cutting down a tree? It's no, it's no longer there to absorb um, carbon emissions. Is that the problem? Yeah, actually, if I could step in there, I, I spent many, many years uh, wandering the bush looking at deforestation and now several years researching it. And uh, the, the thing with deforestation, it's what's fascinating is that each year the, the carbon dioxide we emit from fossil fuels, about half of it is taken up by the intact forests, the forests that are left alone. That's an enormous amount of carbon dioxide. So what's happened is that you've had this carbon dioxide fertilisation effect and the trees have been doing their best. Nature has been working so hard to soak up the excess carbon dioxide that we put in the air. But, but when we deforest, it's, 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 um, it's, it's trickery in the accounting system. You see, the, the, the generally accepted way that the IPCC or that the world does uh, carbon accounting is that they, they use uh, gross emissions when it suits them and they use net emissions when it suits them. And de deforestation is one of those net emission factors. What happens is that they look at the land that's not untouched. They look at the managed land and they say, here's the emissions from that managed lands. And it comes down to uh, deforestation. It comes down to 
uh, fires and a few other things. But but what they're doing is they're hiding the bulk of the emissions from deforestation by doing that because the rest of the vegetation, that so-called managed land, is soaking that up big time. So the emissions from um, deforestation are actually about three or four times more than the emissions that, that we general, that generally agree in the IPCC accounts. And this is this is trickery of a large scale. And, and I'll show you, I'll just talk about another bit of trickery. Something you mentioned earlier, Glenn, cars versus cows. Um, the, the, well, actually, I should I should step back just a minute, if I can you, you can indulge me. Um, we finished eating our way to extinction about three years ago, basically. And um, at that time, we had the best science, and, and we talked about this before, the, the 14.5% uh, 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 that uh, animals contribute to climate change. That was the best that could be done, and we couldn't argue more than that at that time. But there's been a revolution in the science over, the, over that time. And one example of this, it gets back to Glenn. <clears throat> Last year, a paper was produced in PNAS, Dreyfus and others, and it looked at um, this accounting trickery in terms of fossil fuels. And, it, and it, what, it, what it found was that when we burn fossil fuels, we release carbon dioxide, it warms the planet. We also release sulfur dioxides and nitrogen oxides, which, which cool the planet. It's called global dimming. If you've ever been to a big industrial city, you see it as the gray smog, the white smog, it's, it's everywhere, Asian uh, cities exhibit it uh, greatly. So this has been cooling the planet and the amount of cooling is so strong that it's almost balanced the warming from carbon dioxide. So when you look at the, the, the net warming from fossil fuels, you find that um, it's been just 20% of the global warming that we have now. And that the biggest factor in global warming that we have now is from methane. Methane has caused half the global warming, just over half a degree by itself. And most of that 20% from fossil fuels is actually the methane component of fossil fuels. <laughs> so um, this, this uh, counting trickery has so misled us. If you look at, at deforestation, getting back to your point, deforestation emissions going way, way, way back in deep history, Deforestation emissions have always been greater than fossil fuel, and fossil fuel comes with this with this cooling effect as well. So, the the big changes that we've seen on planet Earth have been due to deforestation that doesn't carry this burden of cooling and methane. So, um, uh, uh, apart from the the, uh, the 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 opportunity costs that we're talking about would devoting that land back to nature to draw down. Apart from that, the, the impact of animal agriculture is way more than the official figures suggest. So, you know, we, we the, the science community, I'm looking at myself, and also uh, the, generally the politicians, the other, the climate scientists have got to recognise that we've been kidding ourselves, that emissions are way different to uh, what we um, what we expect. Sorry, I've taken the floor for too long. I'll uh, I'll hand it back. What what's the summation of what percent of greenhouse gas emissions are coming from animal agriculture? Your best estimate? Oh, my best estimate. <laughs> I I like everyone else looked at at Salish Rao's figure of eighty seven percent a couple of years ago, and um, I was scratching my head at that time. I've moved on a lot, but. At that time, I thought this is ridiculous. How could that possibly be true? So I ran the sums. This is why I did the explanatory series of uh, of short videos explain on YouTube, and and the the, the sums are quite amazing. You see, <clears throat> that eighty seven percent figure is based on earlier work by Goodland and Anhang that uh, that had two very controversial elements in it. First of all, they considered that the breath, the respiration from cattle, is an emission. That was poo-pooed. <laughs> and then they considered that uh, methane should be accounted for over 20 years, not 100. And that was 
roundly criticised. So, so if you take out those two factors, what you're left with is, um, and you include the new data that we have now on um, if you repurpose that land, rewild that land, how much will it draw down? If you include that as an emission in the in the calculation, it comes out at 87%. And it doesn't matter whether you count for methane over 20 years or 100 years, in, in the sums, it comes out as 87%, even though the total changes. So um, now I'm, I'm fully believing that, um, uh, and, and see that, that um, that net accounting for deforestation that I was talking about before, that's not even part of that measurement. And most, as we know, most deforestation is for agriculture and animal agriculture. So when you include that, when you include the other things like uh, the fire emissions, you see, we burn the world every year and that releases um volatile organic compounds, it releases methane, it releases all sorts of nasties that turn into other things like tropospheric ozone, which we don't even count, which is a big greenhouse gas. So so there's all these other factors that aren't counted <coughs> above the 87%. So if you if you if you step back one moment and you look at planet Earth and you say, how do we manage our Earth? How do we manage our our little planet, blue planet? And and George Monbiot's book, I've just finished reading it, brilliant book. <clears throat> he, he says that if aliens were to visit the UK, they would think that the dominant life form was sheep. And that says it all. Globally, it's beef, it's it's cattle. But we give so much of our of our land, so much of our most precious resource to animals that we are preventing that land by burning it and by grazing it. We're stopping the trees coming back. We're preventing it from, um, from nature coming back and soaking down all that carbon dioxide, which is itching to do. It's, it's really keen to do this, but it can't because we're preventing it. So if you look at those factors, I believe now that, um, that climate change is, is, is almost totally caused by um, deforestation and and the uh, and methane th those sort of emissions. So so eighty seven percent. I also concur with Sally Rao is I think a low estimate of uh, the impact of animal agriculture. Let me jump in with an anecdote there about a conversation I had with Silas. I said, you know, Silas, you you were being conservative with this estimate because you didn't include the exhalations of 25 billion farmed animals in his calculations. Um, he, he also didn't include many other factors simply because they're impossible to measure. Gerard mentioned the uh, pasture maintenance fires that are set around the world. So everything that the cows don't eat gets burned. You know, the trees, the, the bushes that grow on the grazing land annually get burned. Nobody's measuring how much uh, in the way of greenhouse gases goes into the atmosphere from pasture maintenance fires around the world. He also didn't include, because I don't think there's any way to measure it, the bottom trawling of the ocean by industrial fishing and how much carbon gets kicked up into the ocean by bottom trawling of the ocean and how much that reduces the carbon capture of the ocean. He didn't include, because how do you measure it? the loss of sea forests and phytoplankton populations, again, caused by fish, industrial fishing. So I said, Silas, do you, do you have any back of the envelope estimate if you included all those factors, how much uh, of greenhouse gases uh, could really be attributed to animal agriculture? And he said, Glenn, it, it might be 125%. And I laughed because how could it be more than 100%? But he was right, because if you think about it, what we need to do is get to drawdown. And to get to drawdown, you need to reduce um, greenhouse gases by more than 100%. If we get to 100%, we're just staying stable. We need to draw down. And indeed, it could be that animal agriculture is responsible for more 
than than the amount of our annual uh, uh, emissions when you factor in carbon opportunity costs that we could be drawing it down. Well, if if we did that, if we didn't have any animal agriculture, what would they have to switch to? Because you wouldn't want to switch to something else that also had a big cost on the environment. So when you talk about switching away from animal agriculture, what would be ideal for them to switch to so that that new thing didn't also have a negative impact? Well, I would speak to that and say um, that you know, anytime you move up the food chain, you have profound inefficiencies. I mean, it's just a fact that it takes a certain amount of biomass to produce flesh or milk or eggs from an animal. And it's always inefficient because a lot of that biomass, whether it's corn or soy or grass, is going to turn into hoof and hide and bones and feathers and feces and body heat and energy the animal uses to move around. So it's kind of like a protein factory in reverse. So anything plant-based that is at the bottom of the food chain is going to be more efficient than anything animal-based, ultimately. That said, absolutely, some crops are more sustainable. Some crops use more water or less water. Some crops are better on the soil. Some, you know, lentils, all of the legumes and pulses are particularly beneficial from an environmental standpoint. They fix nitrogen, they're high in protein, they're super nutritious. If you look at the blue zones where people traditionally have the, lived the longest healthy lives, legumes is one food that they consume in all of them. So, you know, I think that's a great start, just beans for beef, right? Um, but, um, you know, and then we've got all the plant-based burgers and the, you know, fake meat sort of things and plant milks and all that. And, you know, the devil's in the details. Uh, you can make uh, plant food, plants, plants into all kinds of different products in a factory. And I think environmentally speaking, all those plant-based products are a huge step forward. Obviously, no animals are killed in the production of them. So there's ethical considerations there. From a health perspective, uh, it's arguable. It depends. You know, uh, probably they're somewhat healthier, lower in saturated fat and whatnot. But they're they're not. You know, hyper processed foods are not what we need to gravitate towards from a health perspective. From an environmental perspective, I think the planet just wants us to stop eating animals. Um, Captain Paul Watson said that seventy percent of the oxygen in the planet comes from the oceans. So, um, and he, so he said, if the oceans die, we die. So um, what would cause the ocean to die? Is ocean acidification the cause of it? And what is ocean acidification? What's causing it? And how would you stop it? Um, I, I might jump in there. Uh, the biggest factor that's in, affecting the oceans at the moment is nitrogen phosphorus pollution. Um, what what's happens is that uh, we've we've created reactive nitrogen out of thin air, basically, with the Haber-Bosch process. We've created all this chemical fertilizer that we've thrown on crops. Those crops are then fed to animals, which which uh, concentrate those point sources. They go into lagoons um, uh, to break down. They're not treated. All the human sewage around the world is treated, but not the animal sewage, which is many times greater. So that's the reason why whenever there's a flood, all floodwaters are considered toxic because of the salmonella, E. coli, and all of the other uh, nasties that are in the water. But that, it, that enters the water, uh, uh, the, 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 the streams, the, the rivers. Uh, it, it kills the rivers, basically. Wherever you see the, the, the algae going crazy, that means there's too much nutrient, too much uh, uh, nitrogen. And so eventually that ends up in the oceans where it causes dead zones. There's now three to 400 dead zones around the world. Um, it, the, 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 off India and, and Gulf of Mexico are two big one areas, but even the open oceans now are depleting in oxygen. So what happens is that <clears throat> the nutrients get into the water and algae love those nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, and they they blossom, they bloom, and and um, that that sucks up all the nutrients. And and these these living things create a lot of oxygen while they do this, but then they die when the nutrients run out and they sink to the bottom 
in the process, stripping all the oxygen from the water. So this dead water flows downstream. It might have a lot of algae still in it. Uh, it it's toxic. And that enters the waterways, enters the oceans, and deoxygenates the oceans. So you, you end up with all these dead zones. That's the, that's the big thing. That's the major uh, uh, symptom, if you like, of the health of the ocean right now. We're killing it. Okay. And um, are we having um, water shortages in the United States and the world? Are we about to have them? Um, you know, I, it seems for a lot of people like they don't really think this is an issue because there's water coming out of their tap, there's water in the store. So when people say that they're concerned about water shortages, um, or is this happening? And what is the, again, what does this have to do with animal agriculture or eating a hamburger, um, whether we have enough water? Um, water is, I, I believe, I mean, animal agriculture is, I believe, the biggest use of, of water uh, that we have in the country. Is that right, Ocean? Yes. So um, water is a serious, serious problem for humanity. Um, we are getting a lot of our water from groundwater, all those wells that we pump water up through. And in most cases, we're using up water that accumulated over millions and millions of years as it trickles down drop by drop through the rocks into, the, into these pools and lakes underground. We're depleting it at a very unsustainable rate. What happens when those wells run dry? In some cases, we start digging deeper wells, some, sometimes a thousand feet, 2000 feet down, where it takes an enormous amount of energy. Eventually, you just can't do it anymore. You hit, you hit granite, you can't dig. So we're in a lot of places right now where we're in a perilous, perilous spot where people are gonna start running out of groundwater. They can't dig any more wells. What happens then? If the rainwater isn't enough to provide agricultural needs or to provide needs for humanity in that area, it turns into a desert, essentially. It becomes uninhabitable for humans. And so we're, or we have to pipe water in from somewhere far away, and then that area may soon run out. Um, so we have a water crisis that is brewing rapidly. There are probably about one to two billion people on this planet who are dependent for their water in their eco in their immediate ecosystem and community on water supplies that are completely unsustainable and that could run out in the next generation or two. And then on top of that, even the, the rainwater is coming in spurts and unreliable fact amounts. So we're getting floods in some places and we're getting big droughts in other places because climate chaos is unfolding. And so even there, we're seeing a problem. We're seeing glacial melt. And soon enough, when there aren't glaciers, you will no longer have the steady supply of, of water coming in from the mountains in a lot of places, which will in turn cause India and China to have serious water problems, which they have not had before. Put all that together, it's really severe. But the good news is it's true. Eating lower on the food chain can make a massive difference. It takes about 2,000 gallons of water to produce a single pound of feedlot beef in the United States today. Imagine sticking up pile of one gallon water drugs half a mile high. That's what we're talking about for one pound of beef. So you basically save more water by not eating one hamburger than by not showering for a couple of months. And, and go ahead, I was going to say, and yet when the state of California faced a water crisis, did they address animal agriculture? No, they addressed sprinklers and, and yeah, showers, right? Exactly. And, and here's, the, here's the amazing thing, folks. So in our state of California, where I live, um, we actually grow a lot of alfalfa. It's the, it's the number one crop in the state. Alfalfa is used for livestock, and it's a very water-thirsty crop. And most of our alfalfa is being shipped to China and Saudi Arabia for them to feed to their cattle. So... And it's not a very lucrative crop, by the way. They don't pay top dollar for alfalfa, even if it's from California. So California has got some of the richest fields and farms in the world. We grow 80% of the world's almonds. We grow a tremendous amount of the world's vegetables and fruits. And yet here we are growing alfalfa in epic quantities. Saudi Arabian companies own significant amounts of farmland in my state. 
and they're taking that land and they're using it and using our precious water to feed their cattle. Now, I know, I just think that makes no sense, right? And so when you look at the math and you look at the numbers, you see that you know livestock are consuming far more water in the state of California than all the humans in the state combined for not just domestic consumption, but all the businesses and golf courses and swimming pools. And yet California imports most of its beef. So is a, a perfect solution to solve all the problems if we just eat fish from fish farms, if they grow them like on land in giant vats? Like, does that solve all the problems um, if we use fit, if we just eat fish, lots of fish from fish farms? Is that and, and, and fish farms that are like in on the land in big tubs or whatever? Is that a great solution? That is not. <laughs> Certainly from a health perspective. Uh, the, the film uh, "Eating Your Eating Our Way to Extinction" uh, uh, gave some very dramatic footage on uh, fish farms. These are, you know, essentially what these fish farms are. They're like um, feedlot operations for fish. All the all the downsides you get from crowding pigs together and crowding cows together, you get from crowding fish together. Uh, so they're an environmental nightmare and a health nightmare. And um, actually, if I can add to that, Stephen, your question about what the solution is, about uh, a decade ago, the Stockholm International Water Institute produced a, re a report called Feeding a Thirsty World, and they projected out, they looked at water use around the globe, and they found that the only way that we'll have enough water by 2050 is if we reduce our intake of meat by 75% globally. That means that developed countries <clears throat> need to reduce meat by more than 90%. So uh, there's your answer. Um, it, 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 animal agriculture takes up so much water that if we are to survive into the future, we need to have crops that feed us, not feed animals that feed us. What if we don't eat meat, but we just have lots of eggs and milk? Will that work? All animal products are, if, you, if you're worried about wastage, um, the, 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 the most efficient um, common food at the moment is chicken. And uh, with, with chicken, for every um, uh, four kilos of protein in, we get one kilo, uh, five, pro five kilos in, one kilo out. So it, it's like sitting down to dinner to five bowls of pasta and throwing out four and eating one. So, you know, that sort of wastage is unconscionable. How can we continue that and expect to have a planet that can support us in the future? It can't. And that's what we're doing. We're eating into the natural capital of this world, this world that supports us, by deforesting, by trashing, by by uh, denuding the the land, uh, by by polluting the water and the air, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, you know we're, we're we're eating into nature's capital for our current consumption, leaving nothing for future generations. So are they the ones who are having to bear the brunt of it? I'm I'm afraid that they will have to, unless we wake up. And do we have, how does, again, eating a hamburger directly affect biodiversity loss? Um, and let me ask, expand that question. How does it affect biodiversity loss and how does it affect species extinction? It's hard to connect. I go to a restaurant, eat a cheeseburger. How am I affecting biodiversity loss and species extinction? And does it matter if we affect biodiversity loss and species extinction? One of my uh, friends is Tashka Yawanawa. He's the chief of the Yawanawa tribe in Brazil. They're a community of several hundred that are trying to live in their traditional way um, and keep hope and their culture alive in the face of all of the threats of colonization and an ecosystem loss. They're also the stewards of the land. They have a very large area of rainforest and in, in Brazilian law, they are the protectors of it. And that's how they see themselves because they've been granted title to this land. Um, 
they have encroachment, however, on the land, the rainforest land that they are helping to protect. Rainforests are sometimes considered the lungs of the earth. They have a level of biodiversity most of us cannot even fathom. Um, and, uh, and yet uh, what they face is encroachment from ranchers. In fact, uh, the past president of Brazil was his biggest backer was the cattle industry. And he was very anti-indigenous. These things go together in Brazil because the indigenous people want the rainforest, which is their homeland, intact. They see themselves as stewards of it. And the ranchers want to chop it down and burn it so they can have more grazing land. And so, um, you know, the, the Yawanawa people, actually, we helped them with a nonprofit that I ran some years back to raise money so they could buy an airplane and a satellite phone so that they could patrol the area and look for signs of illegal ranching operations and then report them to the government so that it could be stopped. This is the direct confrontation they were in regularly. This is one little example that illustrates the larger picture, which is that the single largest driving force behind the destruction of traditional ecosystems and rainforests being the most powerful one when it comes to biodiversity is livestock production. Number two is cutting down land to grow soybeans. Guess where the soybeans are going? The livestock. So at the end of the day, if you wanna ask whose fingers are really on the chainsaw, well, it's the consumers. It's the people who are whose appetite for beef is causing this. And by the way, rainforest beef for the most part is grass-fed beef. You know, those cows are eating grass and people think that's a great thing, but I don't think so. And just as a yeah. side, I don't, I'm going to go ahead. I, I can add to that, Ocean. The, the um, grass-fed industries are perhaps the most destructive industries on the planet. You're right. People think that they're more natural. People think that it's better than confiding, confining animals in, in feedlots. But um, it's so wasteful, and it's, it's most wasteful of our most precious resource, which is land. So if you argue for grass-fed beef, for example, and, and not lot-fed, what you're doing is you're arguing for more deforestation. And there was a study done in North America last year that said that if we, um, comparing the current production methods, which include feedlot as well as growing up young on grass, compared with totally grass-fed, we'd need four times the area so, which we don't have, we, you know, it's just not possible to have that land. So you, you're arguing for deforestation if you argue for grass-fed. The other aspect of grass-fed is that most grass-fed animals are malnourished. Um, they're not getting the nutrients they need. You look at uh, pictures of, of, of cattle, say in Africa, where they are totally grass-fed, those cattle don't look anything like the condition that you see cattle in, say, the North America. And the reason for that is that they're fattened for their last 100 days in feedlots. And they there, they correct the imbalance of nutrients. There, they bring the meat back to marketable quality meat. So, um, you know, the, the current system is very efficient at producing lots of good quality, good quality meat. But um, if we go to grain fed, which uh, grass fed, which a lot of people advocate this, but better, it's not better at all. It's malnourished and it's, it, it hits the, uh, the forest. So all around, it's bad. A few weeks ago, I heard Al Gore speak on climate change. And as usual, he concentrated solely on uh, fossil fuel burning. But his one reference to animal agriculture was to celebrate how wonderful regenerative agriculture is, which is a <laughs> sort of a subset of the grass-fed meat. Uh, and it's just nonsense. It's just a hoax. The, I mean, something like 1% of the beef eat it, eaten in the United States is grass-fed beef. And a small percentage of that is the so-called regenerative beef. And, and we would need four planet Earths to, to eat regenerative beef. Uh, and it's no healthier for you than, uh, than, the, than the feedlot beef. It's equally unhealthy. Um, I don't know I, how- I may, If I may just uh, add to that, I just wanna say that, um, you know, personally, I feel sad about that. Like 
I, I want any solution that'll help our planet. And when I first heard all the enthusiasm about regenerative beef, I was like, wow, if it works, I mean, whatever, right? But but unfortunately, as you're saying, it's 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 a mirage. Um and um and so everybody knows though, um most uh all beef pretty much starts out on grass. So they the first half or more of a cow's life is in the US, for example, is is on grass and then they're moved to feedlots for the finishing slash fattening stage. So mm -hmm. they may gain 800 pounds in the fields, and then they'll gain their last half of their weight um, to get to 14 or 1600 pounds in a feedlot. So um, that's just the typical life cycle. So we're all aware of how that works. And grass fed typically also means grass finished, which means they live their whole life on pasture. And instead of taking another six months to gain that extra weight, they take another year or two and so, right. and they end up at a little weight lighter, like they end up at 12 or 1400 pounds instead of 1600. So feedlots intensify, they speed up the process and all that feed stuffs makes them get fatter faster. And, uh, but unfortunately when they're on the grass fed area, they, they're out there way longer belching methane and taking right. up space, which means that it actually winds up being less efficient from a like land use perspective. Um, one yeah, thing actually, I want, I, Sorry, if I can add to that, Ocean. Um, I've just finished a uh, an investigation into regenerative grazing, regenerative ranching, and uh, there's there's three tricks that are used uh, extensively. What you have is confirmation bias. If you want to believe that it's good for the planet, good for the soil, good for carbon soaking and everything, uh, you'll believe that. And and soil science is such a dark art and really hard to do properly that um, you get this confirmation bias. But there's three things that, uh, that the studies that support the claims, or they, they say support their claims, they're based on three things, which are really uh, such wonderful trickery. I call it the, the bluffer's guide to soil carbon. And, and the, the first thing that they do is that, um, well, if, if you take cropland, any land that's being cropped, the soil in cropland that's been turned over is depleted of carbon dramatically. So if you if you return that cropland to grassland, automatically the grasses staying on the ground and and their roots growing underneath will uh, increase the soil carbon. So that's that's the first trick you look for. Um, the second trick is even better, and that is that um, places places like White Oaks pasture they have these uh, chicken pens that uh, fertilise the ground and then they move them around and it fertilises so the cattle eat that. Um, <laughs> the trick here is that the, the, uh, the, the carbon increase in the soil, which it will increase if you do fertilise like that, the carbon increase comes from the grain that's fed to the chickens, not from the, the management practice, the grazing management. So the, the imported carbon for the soil comes from grain, not from management. And the, um, the third thing that they do is, um, oh, what, what is it? Um, oh, it eludes me now. Um, but, but anyway, there's, there's three tricks. So I'm, I'm writing it all up now. It should be available pretty soon. But, but it is. It's smoke and mirrors. It's trickery, unfortunately. And, but it's great for marketing. And it, and it seems to have a, a an effort a, a, a groundswell behind it now that will make it continue. Um, we're, I don't know how people feel about this, but I find there's something very heartbreaking when you read the statistics on lions, elephants, rhinos, hippos, and other majestic wild animals. Um, if you just read the rate of how much there's less and less and less of them. I'm in the direction it's going. Is this also affected by us eating animal products and how? Yes, it all comes down to land use again. You know, the more of the earth that we can protect and leave in its native state or return to as close to its native state as we could return it, then the more uh, room there is for the animals to thrive. And, you know, what, it, what is driving biodiversity loss is the loss of, of forests. So, um, you know, the, the, there's just not enough area for these uh, great 
you know, uh, animals that you've mentioned to be protected. So would we still, if we switch everyone to quinoa, millet, amaranth, buckwheat, teff, chickpeas, lima beans, lentils, vegetables, they still need land. They still need water. Um, did it organically. Is, you know, how much is there, do we have enough land um, and resources and water to grow enough food to feed the planet of if we were growing lentils and lima beans and quinoa and chickpeas and well, well like of that. course we would have we would have uh, more f food and more I mean ideally if it's done you know optimally we could grow more food than people could eat and we would have more we would have so much land left over that we could rewild it. So, so there's enough land on earth to feed the population of earth. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea to try to limit our population growth, but, it, but we, do, we can grow enough food for 8 billion people and have uh, land returned to be rewilded, returned to nature, if we're eating those foods you mentioned, the legumes, uh, instead of eating meat. So if everyone saw the movie Eating Our Way to Extinction, and at the same time, everyone on the planet ate a whole, an organic, whole food, plant-based diet, is it too late anyway with climate change? Are we, are we, is it too late already with water shortages? Or are you saying that we could literally stop the most terrifying problem in its tracks? Or are you saying we should have done it 50 years ago now, which just it's just too, too late anyway? I vote that it's not too late. Ocean and Gerard? Uh, everything we do matters and we can make a massive difference. Um, for some people are already dead, you know, like for them, it's too late. Some ecosystems are gone. Some species are extinct. They're not coming back. You know, there are absolutely costs to the status quo. We are on a collision course with systemic environmental collapse. So there are compounding factors that are shortening our runway of time. Uh, essentially, we've already put enough carbon into the atmosphere that the next 30 years of planetary cooking, like certain systems are already baked in. Uh, glaciers are melting, and some of that's gonna continue even if we start drawing down carbon fast, but we can make a massive difference. The difference between, say, more climate chaos and an unlivable future on planet Earth may only be a few degrees, right? Like if your human body gets up to say 100 degrees, you have a fever. If you're 105, you feel horrible and you can't even think. If you get 108, you're probably gonna be dead. So what is the point at which the level of chaos, because obviously individual humans can live in a, let's say the temperature outside was four degrees hotter, who cares, right? Not a big deal, but ecosystems are finely tuned to their climate. And if you change the climate too fast and too rapidly, the plants die, the animals die, things collapse. So that's the thing that we're up against. And it is serious and it is severe, but I, I believe that we can make a massive impact and we can draw down carbon and we could turn these things around and make a huge difference. And water, absolutely. I mean, my goodness, there's still, most of us in the world still have enough water right now. If we stop you know, using most of our water for livestock production will free up that ladder water. We won't have to pump it out of the ground and the aquifers can actually replenish, which is incredibly heartening. Ecosystems can be restored. We can actually turn this around. We can have more biodiversity. We can have more land for all of the world's creatures to live in harmony. Um, we can rewild. George Monbiot talks about rewilding as the central pillar of uh, sequestering carbon. And he says that the number one obstacle we face to that is livestock production, because that's that's where the land's going right now. We've got to rewild. And I, I believe that we can absolutely make a massive difference and, and leave our grandkids a world where, that we're proud to pass on to them. And it starts with the food on our plates. Well said, Arshan. So let me, re if anyone would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. But let me just re-ask the exact same question. If someone in our audience has influence in the world, if someone's really powerful and rich and someone could somehow figure out to reach the masses, are you saying that the problem of climate change, water shortages, food shortage, deforestation, desertification, 
ocean acidification, coral reefs dying, species extinction, all these things, we still have hope and we could make a dramatic possibly solve if we got every person on the planet to get, eat an organic whole food plant-based diet, or are you saying it's still just not enough and don't bother? Just what exactly is your thought of how, how far would this would really work or are we just trying to make ourselves feel good? I think it's the only hope. I know some people say to me that it's uh, unrealistic to try to create a vegan world, which has become my life's work. Um, and I know the odds against it. But on the other hand, when you see the way we're headed, when you see the reality of global warming, it is the only thing that will work. Uh, you know, we have been trying to attack the climate crisis for the last 30 years or so in the same way by focusing on energy generation. And we're burning more fossil fuels than we were 30 years ago. So at what point do people say, well, that's not working very well. I'm all for a transition to electric vehicles and so forth. Uh, I'm all for solar power. But clearly, that's not going to solve the problem. I mean, it's just delusion to think that that's going to solve the problem. Um, you know, solar panels do not sequester carbon dioxide. So you have to look at both sides of the equation. I, I sometimes use an analogy to the budget. You know, they try to balance the budget by cutting spending. And if you only try to balance the American budget by cutting spending, you're never going to get a balanced budget. You have to increase revenue at the same time that you cut spending. And the analogy here, the revenue is what we get with carbon sequestration. We're bringing in the carbon dioxide. We're bringing in the carbon. We're bringing in revenue. And unless, you know, if all, we're only looking at how much we're emitting when we're burning coal, and we're not looking at how much we could possibly sequester if we had healthy oceans, if we had healthy forests, then we're missing half of the equation. Gerard, yeah, you well said, Glenn. Um, if, if I can um, add to that, um, it's, it's such a clear decision in my mind we devote 37% of the planet, as we've been discussing, to grazing animals. Now, that land gives us just 5% of our protein. So are we collectively able to switch off red meat and some dairy and have a habitable planet? Switch off all meat and have a wonderful planet. Uh, it, that's the decision. 5% of our protein for saving the planet. Uh, can we do it? I think we will because we're slow, but not stupid, we humans. <laughs> I might add that I think uh, all the fish we eat is something like 3% of our calories. So we're destroying 70% of the earth for 3% of our calories. And by the way, I think the cows are eating more fish than we are. <laughs> so uh, if you think about, you know, Gerard was talking about the ocean dead zones before. Look at the big picture. We have nitrous oxide generated by nitrogen fertilizer. The nitrogen fertilizer runs off into the ocean, creates dead zones, so that ultimately we won't get enough fish to feed to the cows. <laughs> I mean, it's insanity. <laughs> Um, by the way, what happens to all the manure from all the cows? Is there a good system for that? Where does that all go? And does it affect us? <laughs> well, perhaps I can address that. I've just finished a, a report on a, uh, a, a, for a piggery that's going to be uh, put, put, put up near me. Um, what, if you look at the biomass on planet Earth, humans now make up more than 30%. Livestock, animals, make up 60%. But the problem is that that 60%, they're all young'uns. They're all babies. And they're eating like crazy. We've bred them to grow like crazy. Um, it, in a feedlot now, the, the average pig puts on 1.7 kilos per day. They, they, they produce five times more 
by body weight, they produce five times more effluent than humans do because they're so hungry all the time to satisfy this growth urge that which they're bred for. So 60% of the, of the biomass on planet Earth is, is animals that we raise, but they're all babies. So they're all screaming out for food and they produce five times more. They consume five times more than humans consume. All the human waste is treated, but very, very little of the animal waste is treated. It's pumped into lagoons where you have uh, biological reactors where they you know, this biological breakdown or some of the nasties. But but the problem is it's it's not regulated all that well. And every time there's a flood rain, which happens more often now, all of that nutrient gets washed into and kills ecosystems downstream. And this is why nitrogen pollution is considered the worst environmental pollution on, on the planet right now. Um, we have... Uh, people that passionately dislike the Republicans and people that passionately dislike the Democrats. And there are many people in our audience who eat a whole food plant-based diet, but they despise the Democrats and they believe climate change is fake. And they believe, and, and this, you know, the, the problem is there are some things that corporate America is telling us that a lot of us don't believe. So a lot of people have lumped this in with it. So they don't believe things coming from the food and medical industry. So they've kind of lumped climate change as another thing not to believe that is a Democrat agenda to, um, what's the reason? A Democratic agenda to get more control. And, and they're not totally crazy because there are a lot of things that are being done by different parties to gain more control. And so I understand what everyone's saying, but at the same time, we want to, clarify whether climate change is just another scheme by one of the parties to get more control over you, or this one really is real. So when it comes to climate change, what do you want to say to all our audience who doesn't actually believe it's real? They think it's uh, just, uh, like I said, uh, yeah. a, a democratic party thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, First of all, um, the Republican Party, to the best of my knowledge, is the only major political party on earth that doesn't acknowledge that humans are causing climate change. Um, so this is pretty much a worldwide consensus outside of US politics. Now, various governments have different opinions about what to do about it, but nobody's really seriously arguing about whether it's real um, at a partisan level around the world. Um, you know, I, I would be thrilled, I'll be honest with you, if if it was true that this was a hoax and we didn't have it, like, oh my God, I'd sleep better at night. But right. uh, so I don't have an agenda here. I just, I actually, my agenda is I just want a world for my kids, you know, um, and all of our kids. But unfortunately, it's it's very, very real. And the more research that comes in, the more we're learning that it's actually accelerating faster and there are more feedback loops in play than we thought. So even a, a generation ago, I was talking about it. We were talking, my dad and I were talking about it, but but it's it's far more rapid and severe than we thought. Like they always have these margin, this range of like worst case to best case scenario. Well, we're at worst case level so far consistently and then some as far as how serious it is. So I'm sad to say that it's all too real, but I absolutely get the the feeling that there are powers that be that are trying to use everything to get more power and control so that they can enrich themselves and enrich their Republican and Democrats are all in some ways uh, more uh, focused on their donors than, than the well-being of the people. And in many cases, the folks who are profiting from the status quo are the ones who got the money to reinvest in buying political favor. Um, so, you know, the pharmaceutical companies are making a killing. The United States spends 19% of our entire gross domestic product on what we call healthcare, which is really disease symptom management. We're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars. And that's not, you know, if we start eating more healthy whole foot plant-based foods, we take a serious bite out of that. You know, 80% of our medical spending is on chronic diseases. 80% of them can be prevented or reversed with healthier diet and lifestyle. So we're talking about trillions of dollars Yes, it would be freed up. Yes, it would make us a much wealthier and much happier and much healthier population. But a few established interests are going to lose a lot of money if we do that, right? So, so there are there's money being made off the status quo. Um, and uh, I think that uh, 
what I say to folks who don't believe in climate change is, do you want to live? Do you want to be healthy? Well, then we got to eat lower on the food chain because look at the data, look at the research. We have thousands and thousands of studies published in peer-reviewed medical journals that, that show that going plant-based, whole foods plant-based can be your best way to extend life expectancy probably by eight or 10 years and health expectancy even more. And so there's all kinds of doors in essentially. And I don't think the rainforests care a heck of a lot whether you go plant-based because you're a bleeding heart liberal who's worried about the future of life on earth or because you're a you know, self-centered you know, libertarian who just wants to do what's right for you and you want to live a long, healthy life, right? At the end of the day, the rainforests are better off either way. So whatever the doorway is that we're going to walk through, I think there are so many reasons to move in a plant-based direction. And I love to show all the doors personally. Thank Steve, you. Uh, often you hear people... Uh express regret that there's so much polarization in this country. And they say, why can't the Republicans and the Democrats just get together and be reasonable and work together? Well, let me give you an example of one thing they agree on. Virtually all the Democrats and all the Republicans in Congress vote for farm subsidies that go overwhelmingly to animal agriculture. So that seems to be the one thing they will agree on is that we should keep this system going that's destroying the planet. Okay. I, I will say I was recently at the White House conference on hunger, nutrition, and health, and I was very heartened by some of the conversations taking place there. Senator Cory Booker is on the Senate Ag Committee. He is a vegan. Um, he is raising this issue consistently and powerfully, tying it to social justice and social equity, tying the environmental side and the health side, and I'm just so grateful for him. Um, if each of you could make a closing 30-minute statement to sum up your thoughts and then also tell us the best way to stay in touch with you, your books, your projects, your website, that would be great. Ocean, you want to go first? Sure. I think you meant 30 seconds, I imagine. Um, yes. Yeah, uh, okay. So my key thought is uh, with every bite you take, you hold incredible power. You're literally voting not only for the health you want, but also for the world you want. And when you claim that and make it a conscious choice, well, it can feel really good to know that you're part of the solution. Um, you can follow up with me by going to foodrevolution.org. We've got hundreds of articles on our website. Go to foodrevolutionsummit.org and check out our, our online summit docuseries. Um, yeah, there we go with Food Revolution. Oh, and I have a book, 31 Day Food Revolution, Heal Your Body, Feel Great and Transform Our World. It's available online, Amazon, and so forth. So those are a few resources. And I just want to thank you all for your time, your attention, and your participation in this movement. Great. Thank you. Glenn? Uh, I'd like to point out that uh, we are self-healing mechanisms, right? If you ever wound your arm and you go to the doctor, the doctor dresses the wound. The doctor never says, I want you to go home and scratch it. The doctor says, leave it alone and it will heal. And we heal remarkably well. Well, so can the earth. But for the earth to heal, we have to leave as much of it alone as we can. And there's no path to leaving enough of the earth alone to heal other than for humans to eat a vegan diet, a plant-based diet, so that we can rewild as much of the earth as we can and we could end industrial fishing and leave the oceans alone. That is the only path to reversing climate change. And as for whether climate change is real, I mean, the science is very basic. The first experiment done to prove that carbon dioxide warms the atmosphere was done in 1856. <laughs> this isn't new stuff. Uh, people can find me at glennmerzer.com. My books are Food is Climate and Own Your Health. And I'm going to have a new book out next month with recipes by Tracy Charles. It's called America Goes Vegan. Great. Thank you. Gerard? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um... I'd like to quote Jonathan Foley. He's the leader of the uh, uh, Project Drawdown, which is a massive undertaking. And of course, the, the number one thing on the list to draw down is to, uh, with forests, to, so uh, regrowing forests. And as Glenn, as you said, it all comes down to land use. And 
I believe that, well, Jonathan Foley says, things happen very, very, very slowly and then all at once. And I think that's true. And I think we, we, we will have a profound impact on our planet and for future generations if we can uh, turn the world plant-based. And, you know, it, it may be that 25% is the tipping point. What are we up to now? About 10%. You know, it's, it's coming. It's inevitable in terms of the environment, in terms of all those factors you mentioned before, Stephen, but we can have a profound impact on biodiversity, climate, water, deforestation, all of those things purely by changing what we eat. And uh, Eating Away to Extinction is available free on YouTube. Uh, Eating, Eating for Tomorrow is the website that uh, accompanies the uh, documentary. And uh, we're, we're working on future short, uh, just digestible documentaries as well. So um, uh, that's, the, uh, uh, that's the future. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate all three of you men taking the time to devote your lives to such an unbelievable movie, Gerard. Really amazing, amazing thing that you guys did. How many people have seen that movie? Oh, to tell you the truth, I don't know. Um, the, it, the, the, we were going to have a, a red carpet release with Kate Winslet um, in, in London and New York, uh, but COVID put a stop to that um, and actually delayed it uh, by a year or so. Um, so. So it wasn't quite the release that we were hoping for, but um, now that it's free on YouTube, um, we're getting a lot of requests for uh, Q and A sessions with the documentary, so um, I think its reach is spreading now more than ever. Uh, Gerard, that that's a you. it's a shame because I'd love to see you walk the red carpet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, congratulations to you and all the people who made that documentary. It's a heroic effort, and you all deserve the most possible accolades for putting that together and. Thank you for whoever funded it and whoever agreed to volunteer to work on it. So thank you, an amazing contribution. Glenn, thank you for all your work, being so devoted, writing books, and being so passionate about this subject. And Ocean, you and your dad have been heroes, and I'm glad to see you taking over where your dad left off and leading a huge movement, with your conference and all the stuff you're doing. We're very appreciative, and I'd all, we'd all like to, uh, I'd like to unmute everyone so we could all thank you and let you know how much we appreciate the work that you're doing. So thank you so I much. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you for your so courage. Thank you. thank you so much. 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 Thank you so much